and welcome to another Healthy Bite. My name is Dr. Ron Early. Well, drugs, they're a part of our world. Uh, in fact, uh, the war on drugs was first started in the 1970s, I think it was early, late 60s, early 70s, by President Nixon. And uh, we could argue about why the war on drugs was started. I think in, some people would postulate that it was his opportunity to disenfranchise people at universities and uh, people of colour uh, in America and uh, a way of criminalising and jailing those uh, forces, those people. Uh, but I think uh, we can say without uh, any shadow of a doubt, uh, if evidence is anything to go by, that the war on drugs has been an abject failure. Rather than uh, prevent harm, it has uh, actually criminalised and jailed uh, and actually killed thousands and thousands, if not millions of people around the world. And it often surprises me that despite the fact that alcohol and tobacco are undoubtedly the, uh, the biggest uh, drugs of concern in our society, and the statistics show that, um, that uh, they are legal and yet uh, things like heroin, cocaine, marijuana, ecstasy, LSD, all of these things are criminalised. I remember many years ago watching one of uh, the barrister Jeffrey Robertson's uh, hypotheticals and he had a panel of experts sitting there and he said, if you had two neurosurgeons about to, um, about to operate on your brain and one was addicted to alcohol and the other was addicted to heroin, who would you rather... Um, uh, operate on your brain and the answer was the heroin person uh, because they'd be incredibly focused on what they were doing and neurologically very focused um, but that is obviously um, uh, not the case uh, that is uh, criminalized and so um, it's it's it often just amazes me that uh, that this has still is still going on to this very day. I had another incident. Uh, I've had so many patients in my practice at various levels, people that worked in the Department of Public Prosecutors, the ombudsman, the um, judges, uh, police, senior police. Uh, I had an undercover uh, policeman as a patient once. He came in in ragged uh, jeans and torn T-shirt and when he sat down, he pulled a gun out from the back of his jeans and put it on the side. Um, I think he turned to me and said, we're not going to hurt each other, are we? And I said, most definitely not. Actually, no, he didn't say that. But, but it did kind of take my breath away. And I said to him, John, tell me, you're an undercover uh, policeman in the drug squad. Are we winning the war on drugs? This would have been about 10, 15 years ago. And he just shook his head and said, look we probably get 5% of the drugs that come in and it keeps me employed. And then you hear senior police off, uh, policemen, in fact, former commissioners, heads of um, the AFP, I think, was, uh, was quoted as saying that, that the war on drugs and criminalisation of drugs just simply hasn't worked and puts an undue, um, undue uh, weight on our society, both cost and so, so, socially, mentally... Uh, and financially, and uh, it's just a lose, lose, lose. In fact, one could, un and when you look at the evidence, and again, I often re reference this, if the evidence is anything to go by, and I know correlation does not mean causation, but I think we can draw a correlation here between drugs that are made illegal and criminalised and the cause that, and the effect that that has. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that literally billions of dollars are spent on policing it, adjudicating on it, and incarcerating people on it. I mean, literally billions of dollars are spent. And the outcome of those jail sentences is never or very rarely positive. So that's the one side. On the other side, there are, because it's a criminal activity, there are literally billionaires being made by the illegal sale of these drugs. So it would seem perfectly logical to me that by decriminalising it and bringing it under government regulation, two very important things would happen. The billions of dollars that are being spent trying to police an unpoliceable, is there such a word? I'm not sure, but an unpoliceable thing like drugs would now no longer be the wasted resource that it is 
Our jails would be emptied, our courts would be emptied, our police could get on with doing other things that are far more urgent and, and, and useful. Um, so that is one side of the equation. But because it is now under government regulation, all revenue that is generated from this industry, and let's make no mistake about it, it is an industry, would be going into government coffers. And people would be treated not as criminals, but would be seen. It would be seen as a medical condition. We know how prohibition worked in the 1920s and 30s in America, and uh, it wasn't a very successful social, political, um, health uh, experience or economic experience. So have we learnt nothing? And so this war on drugs is an issue. And and actually, when we look at drugs in general, we know that heart disease is still number one killer in the world. I think there's something like 50 million people, uh, no, what is it, 18 million people a year die of cardiovascular disease, uh, something like um, 10, or 9, 10 or 11 million die of cancer, and then we have autoimmune conditions and diabetes, even something like 4.5 million people a year die of diabetes. The third biggest killer is prescription medication taken, at, you know, taken as prescribed. And the opioid crisis, or not prescribed, the opioid crisis in America was an excellent example of that. So uh, should we be banning prescription medication as well? Well, obviously we shouldn't. It comes under government regulations and there are schedules which classify various medications according to their potential for harm. And parts of America are now... Um, have legalised marijuana and actually we've done a program with Professor Ian Brighthope on medicinal cannabis. Uses for medicinal cannabis are many and varied and we'll also be doing and have done a, a program with Mind Medicine Australia which is championing the reintroduction or the use of uh, psychedelics, LSD and ecstasy uh, for protracted, incurable conditions sometimes like post-traumatic stress or major chronic depression. Um, so these supposedly criminalised, well, these not supposedly, they have been criminalised drugs, have actually therapeutic properties, qualities, which if properly regulated and managed can have a beneficial effect for society. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to this week's episode, uh, with Paul Dillon, that educator who, over the last 20 or so years, he, he has been going into schools and educating kids about the dangers of drugs, cannabis, ecstasy, cocaine, LSD, a drug I hadn't heard about, GHB, gamma-hydroxybutyrate. Um, it was a very interesting um, uh, podcast. He shared some very promising uh, statistics about alcohol and tobacco use amongst teenagers, amongst school-aged children, uh, and rather disturbing um, uh, statistic around the fact that some prescription medications like Valium and Xanax are really problems in the school. Look, it was a great conversation with Paul, and personally, as the father of two daughters who are now adults, I, I know this was an issue that that we confronted as our, our two daughters were growing up. And I know there was a very strong push for zero tolerance. Just say no. Well, yeah, as though that's going to happen. And I don't think that is a realistic or, or um, particularly right way of approaching this. In our own case, one of the most important things we tried to impart onto our uh, children was not to mix drugs, that was really important, not to try drugs that you didn't actually know where they were coming from, as difficult as that may be. I think it's an important thing to alert our kids to. And probably most importantly, that were they ever to get into trouble, they were always, we were always there for them to call. Under no circumstances was there ever going to be a problem with them giving us a call. In fact, Paul used an analogy saying that what he tries to do is tell kids in schools that there are lots of pillows around them to soften their fall should they fall. And I said to Paul, well, I think one of the most important messages that we tried to convey to our children was that, that the biggest pillar, pillow, pillow of all that our kids could always rely on to fall against was us. 
we would always be there for them no matter what. So zero tolerance is a great idea, but in the real world, I think we have to take a real world approach. I can never understand why politicians are not decriminalizing drugs. And the only reason I can think is either they are completely ignorant of the evidence, they are completely ignoring the evidence, uh, either they are so dogmatic about their stance, and one of my most favourite bumper stickers that I have ever seen is, my karma just ran over your dogma. So I think being dogmatic is a terrible position to be in, particularly when you're in a position of power and are making laws. Or, or and here's a thought, they are just colluding, because as far as I am concerned, the only people that could be benefiting from the current drug law, laws are those that are making billion, millions and millions of dollars from selling drugs that are illegal in our society. And for those lawmakers that are not decriminalising law, uh, the law, then I think, wittingly or unwittingly, I hope it's unwitting, they are colluding with criminal as uh, criminal elements within our society. So I just thought uh, I would share that a uh, little bit of uh, insight into my view on drugs in general, what some of our podcasts have been about with uh, on medicinal cannabis, on, on the Mind Medicine Australia psychedelics, and most recently with Paul Dillon, that wonderful educator that's going out into schools and doing such an important job. It was a great episode. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.